This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. Okay, good afternoon, members. Order. We are now in public session and welcome to today's meeting of the Public Accounts Committee. Uh, members, mobile phones must be set to airplane mode or turned off. It's not sufficient to put mobiles on silent mode as they continue to interfere with the Assembly recording. The session is being recorded in video and audio and can be accessed via uh, online streaming, either on the Assembly website or Democracy Live. Uh, item number one of the agenda is apologies. Have we any apologies? All present. Uh, agenda item two, then, is the minutes of the meeting of the 11th of March 2021, which are pages 6 to 13 of your pack. Are members content that I sign those minutes as being accurate? Agreed. Okay, thank you. Agenda item three then is declaration of interests. Any members, any declaration of interest to make this afternoon in relation to our business today? Uh, Chair, uh, I received ROCS payments for solar panels. Okay, many others? Chair, just to say I've been contacted by Stephen McNeil of the renewables. Okay. So I would refer to a previous declaration I made at this previous yeah. hearing, rather relevant to this one. Okay. Andrews. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> this is Matthew and Carl. Okay. As have I. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, <coughs> sorry, someone else wants to go? No. Um, agenda item four then. Matters are rising. Um, sorry, um, Chair. Yes. Chair, just I've been contacted by Mr. Pollock. I'm not the chair. I'm not exactly. Uh, comes into this meeting or not, but it's in relation to uh, anaerobic digesters. All right, okay. Um, okay, so there are, other than that, are any other uh, agenda item before that is matters arising from the minutes? Are there any matters arising from the minutes? No, okay. Okay, members, then at this stage, Mr. Kieran Donnelly, the Comptroller and Auditor General uh, for Northern Ireland, and Mr. Tomas Wilkinson, Director. Of the Northern Ireland Audit Office will now join the meeting for the remainder of this agenda uh, and Mr Kyle Bingham will join us remotely. Kyle, are you hearing and receiving us okay? Uh, good afternoon, Chair and members. Yes, I can hear it and see clearly. Okay. Good, good afternoon. Um, okay, so agenda item five then, members, um, correspondence, um, pages 17 through to 38 of your pack. Uh, I refer to correspondence dated the 10th of March 2021, your packet, pages 17 to 22, from the Chair's Liaison Group regarding condensed committee stage of the damages, brackets, return on investment bill that is to pass uh, all of its stages in the summer recess 2021. Uh, at this meeting on the 2nd of March 2021, the CLG shared the concerns raised by the Committee for Justice and agreed that the correspondence should be forwarded to all committees for. Uh, their consideration. Uh, members, have you any comments? And you agree? Uh, if not, are you happy to note? Content to note? Yep. yep. Thank you. Members, are referred to correspondence dated the 8th, 12th, and 15th of March in your pack uh, at pages 23 through the 30 um, from Mr. Edward Cook regarding the United Kingdom's planned government office uh, in Belfast and the appointment of Sir Richard Choate as the Chair of the New Fiscal Council for Northern Ireland and of Mr Cook's request for a Freedom of Information Act to Queen's University, Ulster University. Uh, in Mr Cook's correspondence of the 15th of March, he requested contact details for Mr Richard Chute, um, which have now been forwarded. Are members content to note? Hello. Agreed. Okay. Okay, I refer to correspondence then, 12th of March 2021, in your pack, pages 31, from the Chair of the Audit Committee, Mr Daniel McCrossan, MLA. At its meeting on the 10th of March 2021, the Audit Committee received oral evidence from a number of experts as part of its review of governance and accountability arrangements for Northern Ireland Audit Office and the Northern Ireland Public Services Ombudsman, NIPSO. Members, the purpose of the review is to establish the scope for improving the governance and accountability arrangements for the Northern Ireland Audit Office and the NIPSO and the appropriate avenues for implementing any future improvements in the context of the Committee's defined statutory functions in relation to both bodies. 
Members of the Audit Committee are seeking the views of the Public Accounts Committee regarding the quality and service provided by the Northern Ireland Audit Office. Um, I understand that the primary focus of uh, today is in the inquiry, and we can defer this, uh, and members will, I'm sure, accept that. We can defer this item until after Easter to allow more time for consideration. Are members agreed? Agreed? Agreed. Okay, thanks. Okay, members are re referred to correspondence dated the 12th of March 2021, received from Mr. Jeremy Logan, Chief Executive of DVA, in your packs at pages 32 to 36. This is the follow up response to DVA evidence session on the 18th of February 2021. Uh, do any members have any comments? And if not, are members content to note and forward the correspondence to the Audit Office? Content? Uh, members refer to correspondence dated the 15th of March 2021 from Mr. Peter May, the Permanent Secretary and Accounting Officer at the Department of Justice, at pages 38, sorry, 37 and 38 of your pack, uh, to request a deferral of the Public Accounts Inquiry into speeding up justice, avoidable delay in the criminal justice system. Um, members, are you content that we deal with this matter in closed session in the agenda item 8 draft forward work programme? This is great. Great. Thank you. Okay, members, we remain in open session to hear evidence on our sixth inquiry, generating electricity from renewable energy. Broadcasting can ask you to bring in Mr. Mike Brennan, Mr. Richard Rogers, Mr. Trevor McBriar from the Department of the Economy, and also bring in Mr. Uh, Stuart Stevenson of TOA. Mr. Brennan, Mr. Rogers, Mr. McBriar, and Mr. Stevenson, can you hear and see us okay? You're very, very faint. Um, sure, I can, I can hear, but can't, uh, can't see. Okay, we can see you and hear you, Mr. McBriar. Okay. Um, and Mr. Mr. Rogers, are you with us? Yes, indeed. I'm here. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. And um, Mr. Brennan? Yes, I'm here too. Yep, you're very, very faint, uh, Mr. Brennan. If, I, I don't know whether you can move closer to the mic or increase your volume or whatever, but you're very faint. And if we're going to have a lengthy session, which may well be the case, we need to hear you at a higher level of volume than we are currently hearing you. Okay, have my volume set at maximum now? Okay. Well, you, we can we can barely hear you, to be honest. Um, Mr. Chair, his volume is related to his speaker, not his microphone. <coughs> I'm just going to get advice here. Well, okay. Um, what, what we're going to do is, um, if you can, if you can all stay online, uh, we're going to take some take some technical advice from those who will know more than us in terms of potential resolution to this. If you can just bear with us. Okay. Thank you. Members agreed until we get a uh, resolution that we go into uh, recess. Is that okay? Agreed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. Order, uh, members, we are now back in open session to hear evidence on our sixth inquiry, generating electricity from renewable energy. Um, 
Thanks to Broadcasting for bringing in Mr. Brennan, Mr. Rogers, Mr. McBriar from the department and also Mr. Stevenson from the TOA. Um, Mr. Brennan, Mr. Rogers, Mr. McBriar, um, can you all, uh, Mr. Stevens, can you all see and hear us okay? Yeah? Yes. Okay. Yes, we can, yes, sir. Okay, thanks. Can I just remind members and officials it would be uh, helpful in managing part of the meeting if hands up facility could be indicate uh, you're wanting to speak and that you could mute your mic. And as I say, we are in uh, open session. So, agenda item six is the inquiry into generating electricity from renewable energy. Evidence sessions, uh, pages 49 to 180. And at this stage, uh, as chair, I'd like to invite Mr. Brennan, the accounting officer and permanent secretary of the Department for the Economy, Mr. Richard Rogers, head of energy, Mr. Trevor McBriar, principal officer for renewal and renewable energy, to join the meeting. And also in attendance, we have Mr. Kieran Donnelly, Comptroller and Auditor General for Northern Ireland, and Mr. Stuart Stevens and TOA, who's joining us remotely, and Mr. Tomas Wilkinson, Director at the Northern Ireland. Uh, audit Office members, uh, regarding our sixth inquiry into generating electricity from renewable energy, we are receiving evidence session from the Department for the Economy. So, members, in your pack, the following papers the NIAO report on generating uh, electricity from renewable energy at pages 40 to 119, KPMG report on renewable NI, uh, uh, an economic review of small scale wind, pages 120 to 161. Witness biographies of Mr. Brennan, Mr. Richard Rogers, Mr. Trevor McBriar. Uh, the restricted NIAO briefing paper is at 165 to 174. Uh, and then um, the submission of Mr. Owen McMullen, Chairman of West Throne Against Wind Turbines, pages 3 to 6. Submission of Mr. Alan. Evans, MD, Professor Emeritus at uh, Queen's University, pages 7 to 44 uh, of your pack. Uh, submission dated the 16th of 20, uh, March 2021, your pack from Kerry McGorry and Mary McKenna on behalf of Standing Our Ground for Women and Swearance, all of which we've agreed to take as background information and notes. Members, um, you have just received a substantial amount of information. Uh, so. It was only just out today, and it will be necessary, of course, for you to review that, and we can look at that at a later stage. Mr. Brennan, uh, welcome to the Public Accounts Committee, and I invite you at this stage to make an opening statement, and then hopefully you and your colleagues would be available to take some questions. So over to you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Chair, um, and thanks to you and your committee for the opportunity to eventually appear in front of you. Um, I'll just make a few opening comments and then I'll ask Richard and Trevor just to um, set out what their roles are in the department and their professional background because I think their expertise in energy um, will be and their competencies will be an issue as we uh, wander through the next few hours in what are quite technical areas. Um, in terms of opening observations, the first point I would like to make, Chair, is that the Audit Office report recognises that the the policy intent of the narrow scheme um, of increasing the scale of renewable electricity has been achieved. Um, with almost 50% of electricity um, being generated from wind renewable resources in Northern Ireland. And that has significantly reduced our dependence on fossil fuels. It has created hundreds of jobs and brought in significant investment into Northern Ireland, particularly in rural areas. Also, it's worth noting that the, the narrow scheme each year brings in um, s several hundreds of millions of pounds in income into the, the Northern Ireland economy. And, you know, when you think back, the strategic energy framework, when it was published in 2010, um, it said that the, the estimated cost of achieving the 40% the renewable target that was set at that point um, by 2010 would cost uh, households in Northern Ireland um, somewhere between 49 and 83 pounds per annum. Um, the actual outturn cost um, in the audit office report is shown to be somewhere in the order of 31 pounds. Okay, so by that metric, it has been a success. The, the narrow also has made a massive contribution to our decarbonisation agenda, um, but you know there will be a lot more needed in this space in the coming years if we are to get to our target of net zero by 2050. 
the benefit of hindsight is, is always a great thing, sure. Um, but it's important to remember that in the early days, um, there was little real knowledge of renewable technology here in Northern Ireland in terms of costs or outputs. Um, and I'm sure we'll get into the detail of what's happened since 2005 during the course of this afternoon. On the report itself, there are six, six recommendations, three of which fall to DFE as a department. Um, and we are already working on to address those three recommendations as we speak. The, the Audit Office report um, claims that there is some risk of excessive returns being generated through uh, the narrow. The Audit Office report um, in expressing concerns in relation to rates of return forms that view on the basis of one non-grid connected generating station. However, as your committee will, will know, there's more contemporary evidence now available through the, the independent KPMG report, which looked at some 134 stations and the rates of returns that they would generate. We are working on reviewing that information um, with audit office colleagues, and no doubt we will be back to you in, in the coming weeks and months to discuss certain areas of the report. Once we have a clear picture upon those rates of returns, and um, for small scale wind in particular. Um, Chair, I'll, I'll maybe pause there and hand over to Richard and then Trevor just to describe the roles that they fulfil in the department and the, the, the expertise and the professional skill sets that they bring to us. Richard? Thanks, Mike. Um, just to mention that I've worked for uh, more than 32 years in the energy sector. 20 of which were in energy utilities. Um, I was part of the senior management team at Phoenix Natural Gas, which brought natural gas to the greater Belfast area. And in the, in the 12 years I was there, we went from having no natural gas customers to 120,000 and established a business with 80 million pounds of annual turnover. After that, I worked in the fuel poverty sector as managing director of uh, EGA International, EGA PLC was a FTSE 250 company that delivered fuel poverty schemes for governments uh, in the UK and in Ireland uh, and in India and in Canada. Uh, I was also a non-executive director on the board of the uh, utility regulator uh, for nine years, which ended in March 19. And um, uh, for the past eight years, I've worked in the public sector, uh, first on the development of a new energy efficiency initiative and uh, then as head of the department's RHI task force uh, from, from July 17. And since November 18, I've been head of energy group in the department. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Trevor, do you want to briefly set out your background? Sorry, Trevor, maybe it's just me, but I can't hear you. Mr. McBriar, would your microphone be muted, perhaps, or? Sorry, Chair. Okay. Can I ask? Could I ask those who are not speaking, as I've said at the start, to please go into mute? There was during Mr. Rogers' contribution, I could hear music, and then we just had a phone ringing. So please put your phones on mute to respect those here in front of us, please. Okay, Mr. McBriar. Okay, Chair, sure, thanks. Uh, Trevor McBriar, uh, head of uh, uh, Renewable Electricity Branch. Uh, been the, in the civil service for uh, over 42 years, uh, the last 20 of which in the Department for the Economy, and the last 10 in uh, Energy Group. Uh, for the last four and a half years, I've been dealing uh, with issues to do with the Northern Ireland Renewables ob uh, uh, obligation. Uh, including the progression of the NIA report on generating electricity from uh, from renewable energy, uh, along with our partners in the Northern Ireland uh, Utility Regulator uh, and Ofgem, who have uh, responsibility for the administration of the scheme. Thanks, Trevor. Chair, that concludes our initial opening observations. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hildich. Thanks, Chair. Gentlemen, you're very welcome this, this afternoon. And it certainly it can't be denied that there's been great strides made in the renewable energy field since we started off at a base rate of zero. 
Uh, at the outset, were there sufficient resources and staff allocated to the NIRO scheme? Would, what would your views on that be? So, uh, my initial observation, Mr. Hennessy, would be that um, the fact that we went from um, 3 per cent renewal generation in 2005 to almost 50 per cent. Um, and remember, this was actually a UK wide market system. Um, which is to show that the DFE, or Daddy as it was at the Department and now DFE, was adequately resourced to ensure that Northern Ireland played its role in delivering the renewable obligation scheme over the 12 year period. And were there enough staff and resources available to do that in your mind? Yeah. Looking back, yes, I have I've come across no evidence of constraints in terms of the Department that are able to engage with its key partners, Ofgem or the utility regulator. Or to feed into the market system. And it, it might be helpful, Mike, if, if I come in and I explain a bit of background on, on how the, the scheme was resourced. Um, I mean, it, it, just, to, just to let members know that um, the legislative responsibility sits across two bodies. Um, first, the department, we have responsibility for the policy underpinning the narrow, the legislative framework, and setting the support levels. And the utility regulator is responsible for the administration of the scheme. And the utility regulator uh, do this through an agency services agreement with Ofgem. And uh, this is quite appropriate because Ofgem also administer the renewable obligations in GB. There are two renewable obligations over there, England and Wales, and separately in Scotland. And Ofgem therefore administer all three schemes. And, and the ROs over there operate in tandem with the NIRO here in Northern Ireland. So this provides a consistency of approach and obviously you've got the economies of scale in terms of the cost of delivery. So, you know, again, we've been aware from the beginning back in 2005 that the utility regulators had the expected uh, management processes in place under this agency services agreement. Um, then the utility, the utility regulator provides to the department an annual assurance statement, and this actually dovetails with the similar assurance statement that it receives from Ofgem to the UR. Uh, so also very importantly within the year, we are updated by in the department by the utility regulator. I, I would describe it as an excellent collaborative working relationship. Um, things like legislative revisions, which happened almost annually during the scheme, and, and more laterally on the work on closure. And, and as part of that, of course, there is the, the, the fortnightly and monthly meetings, especially the monthly meetings, which is all about ensuring that the money uh, is spent properly. Uh, so there is, a, there is, on top of that, a formal relationship agreement between the department and the utility regulator. And I think in ans direct answer to your question, I mean, we've had in the department three internal audit satisfactory reports plus we took a formal paper um, in, in 2019 to the department's audit risk and assurance committee uh, with, with 16 recommendations on ensuring that we were delivering the scheme in the right way with our partners in, in the utility regular. So I hope that helps to express how we've, um, we've gone about delivering the scheme with Ofgem over the past 15 years. Yes, that, that's very helpful detail. And, and would you confirm then that the reporting and accountability was clear? In the relation uh, in relation to the narrow scheme, yeah, it is in our, in our opinion it was indeed yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, why were other government departments with a clear stake in the narrow scheme not consulted or informed about the scheme? When the scheme was constructed back in two thousand and five, um, it was constructed in um, to replicate what was happening with GB legislation. Uh, so, you know, it was, it was looking back now, as I said earlier, the benefit of hindsight, and in particular reference to some of the findings from the audit office report about uh, engage, engaging with NIEA or with planning authorities. Um, the legislation, um, in retrospect, should have allowed for a greater degree of cooperation across departments. There obviously were some significant constraints protect particularly in relation to sharing data and information um, at that point in time. But it's one of the things that, at this point in time, as we look forward to a new energy strategy, it's one of the areas that we will look to address as we move forward. That's good. Thank you, Mike. Uh, just turning to the Honourable Vic Digester situation, 
and the, the, the thing that stands out is the project or projects at Palomina and Donegal. Uh, clearly, there's a difficulty with the Donegal operation. Uh, was that a part funded scheme with the government, and the Republic? Um, Mr. Elliot, this I'll have to tread carefully here, obviously, because it's still an ongoing commercial entity and there are negotiations underway. Um, it, it was a commercial enterprise taken forward um, with Invest NI asked to provide loan assistance under what's called financial transactions capital. Um, Invest NI did put a loan under the 1982 uh, Industrial Development Order. Um, they provided um, some significant amount of money into the development of um, the AD plant based in Donegal. This was really um, as part of a, a, a wider executive agenda under what was known as the Sustainable Utilisation of Poultry Litter Scheme, SUPL, and it was developed um, jointly with DERA, Invest NI, this department and SIB, um, in recognition that the poultry industry in particular had some acute problems um, in terms of disposal of poultry litter in Northern Ireland. Um, at that stage, there were only really two options. One was to find some export market to send poultry waste to, or to consider um, scaling back on the activities of the local poultry industry. So this SUPL scheme was, was taken up um, by as a number of government agencies. Invest NI put a loan into this commercial company to develop an AD plant in Donegal. Um, it did, it did actually produce, and as I say, that it's still a live commercial entity and negotiations are currently underway about its viability and where we go from here. But it did produce, in my mind, two significant yeah. benefits for, for, for the Northern Ireland economy. Um, the first one was that um, it, it provided a, a disposal point um, for local poultry letter and therefore it, 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 it um, maintained the viability of the, the poultry industry at, at a certain scale. And secondly, we sh shouldn't lose sight of the fact that the biogas produced from that um, it has been used um, to assist um, two major manufacturing plants in, in the greater Belfast area. Um, therefore, the outworkings of that are, I think it's somewhere in the order of about 37,000 tonnes of poultry waste um, has been disposed of just on the Donegal site alone. But it also means that there's less fossil fuel generation within the Belfast area because those large manufacturing plants have been able to use the biogas. Um, what I would say is um, the loan, the Invest NI loan that I referred to, you know, there's been lots of media speculation you know, about the current position of that loan. That loan has not been written off, okay? Um, and the last year or so, in particular, the plant in Donegal has experienced um, some uh, operational challenges, uh, um, partly because of COVID, and those are the issues that are looked at at this point in time. And as I say, as we speak, there are negotiations underway. Um, but you know, there it is an issue about you know the, the poultry industry, its scale in the local economy, and find finding a suitable and environmental friendly way for it to continue to operate. Yeah, just to the lay person, it does seem going to be a potentially ex expensive uh, loss to the department, uh, or invest in as it would be, considering, as you've outlined, the, the uh, difficulties with poultry uh, litter and the significant tonnage that needs to be taken care of, and the fact that the Donegal plant has, uh, has not delivered. I know you said it's delivered a certain degree of 37,000 tonnes over a period of time, but... If that's broken down into the annual turnover, I'm sure that breaks down to a much smaller figure. Uh, what was the logic with the Donegal plant, considering there, there was one at Balamina and potentially maybe somewhere south of the province would have been a better location? Maybe What, what was the business sort of element to that that guided you towards Donegal? Um, I'll, I'll bring Richard in a, in a second, Mr. Hillis, but my understanding was it was really a, a capacity problem in, in the Northern Ireland economy in terms of um, being able to find plant that could dispose of the litter in sufficient quantities. Um, there were some projects that had been considered and developers had brought, you know, looked to advance some projects, but 
and there were difficulties around getting approvals for those projects to proceed. Um, so really, it's, a, it's, it's, it's the nature of the, the poultry industry, its scale and the output from it, and what you can actually do in an environmentally friendly way. way. But I'll bring Richard in here because you know he, he has some technical detail, on, particularly in relation to what happens in Ballymena and why previous schemes did not proceed. I think just to add to what Micah said, I think it's important to clarify that the NIRO accredits generators and one of the one of the acceptable fuels um, for those generators is biogas. And obviously it's the anaerobic digestion that produces the biogas. And it's certainly not, not something I'd want to comment on why the anaerobic digester is in Donegal and not somewhere else. We members will be aware that there are I think off the top of my head, 51 uh, anaerobic digesters, uh, 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 no, sorry, 51 biogas generators across Northern Ireland that use anaerobic digested gas that's produced through anaerobic digestion. But the, the major one, as you say, is actually, uh, as the member says, is in Balamina, it's in Tully Quarry, and it's a three megawatt generator. Um, and. Uh, that has been, after some teething difficulties that we're aware of, because we have engaged with Stream Energy, who are the owners and operators, uh, they, are, they are now processing 40,000 tonnes of poultry litter a year. And, and this is an important issue because obviously we've got nitrate challenges, we've got um, limits that we have to meet, and we've also got with the economic vibrancy. Um, and a, and a, so, it's, so it's a really important plant and it is the biggest. Uh, and just to clarify on the remark I made earlier, it's actually we've got 124 biogas accredited generators in, in Northern Ireland, and they all come from anaerobic digested gas, with the exception of the gas that's transported from Donegal to the uh, generating plants in Belfast at, at Bombardier and Montepay in Dunmurray. Hope that helps. Okay, yes, indeed. Thank you. Sure. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hillish. Uh, Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Chair, um, and thank you for the for, for for coming today. Um, just a, a couple of questions. No doubt, uh, my other colleagues will cover a, a range of issues around this because it's quite a it's quite a complex, detailed, but yet a very important report. Um, the officials will be aware of a report that came out recently, um, and it was reported in the the media in recent days in relation to the energy policy. And, the, and this relates to the NARO scheme. And it said that uh, the Department for the Economy was not seen as a competent authority on energy matters. And concerns were also raised that uh, because of perceived lack of leadership, it may be easy for companies uh, to slow um, or influence the introduction of policies which could affect them with building companies and agri-food, also mentioned specifically. Th these are quite significant concerns around the capacity and capability of the Department of the Economy to take forward schemes. We've had the RHI scheme and we've got the narrow scheme. Uh, what's the response to this, the, the criticism in terms of the capacity and capability of the department? And is there any feeling that that, that has been now properly addressed after the publication of the Damien RHI inquiry report and now this narrow report? Um. I suppose my my initial response would be that um, the RHI legacy will all you know will for some time in the future um, taint anything to do with energy policy that emerges from from this department, um, and you know I have to say, looking back, I find it frustrating that narrow is in some way tainted with with RHI because, as I said in my opening comments, I actually regard what narrow has achieved. Um, to be a significant success, success, um, and you know, it's a good starting point for where we have to go in the decarbonisation agenda, and to meet the renewable targets set um, for for this department and for the executive as part of the program for government. In terms of the capacity of the department to move forward, um, I think you, you can take some considerable reassurance as to how, on that point uh, when you look at how we're progressing. The energy strategy, which will set out energy policy for the executive and the assembly, and um, for for uh, many years into the future. And uh, Richard will take you through the detail on that shortly. But what I would say is that 
energy policy looking forward isn't being const is not being constructed solely within the confines of Netherly and the, the department here in Netherly. Um, there are a number. There are five uh, themed groups setting up, working across not just other key Northern Ireland departments, but a wider range of stakeholder groups like the, the Consumer Council. And um, we also have uh, appointed uh, an external panel, panel of, of energy experts to provide assistance and guidance as we take forward the construct of the energy strategy. So, you know, I can understand why you have the concern looking back at what happened in relation to RHI. But, you know, this, this is the, the assurance I give you is that looking forward, high energy strategy uh, in its widest sense for the executive and the assembly is not being constructed in a silo here in DFE. It really is something that as I say, Northern Ireland departments and a wider stakeholder group. I think, Richard, we have something like 70 stakeholder representatives on the five working groups. I'll actually bring Richard in here now and he, he can take you through the detail of how um, we're, there's a significant amount of scrutiny on the construct of future energy policy. Richard. Yeah, th thanks. Thanks, Mike. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I, I took over as head of energy in November 18 and, and the headline figure, if you like, is we've added about 30 percent to the resource working in energy group in the department and that resources both from within the civil service and from outside and external brought in external energy expertise which was one of the findings of the of the RHI inquiry report um, we've we've made collaboration we've made engagement uh, really the cornerstone of what we've been doing and, and the first outworking of that was when we issued the call for evidence back in December 19 um, we received 161 responses from across uh, from across stakeholders, not just in the energy industry, but from wider stakeholders across Northern Ireland. We, we engaged in three different um, seminars across the country, and not just Belfast focused. So it was, it was truly engaging in, in our opinion. And that will, that will follow now with um, the options consultation, which is the next step, step in landing the energy strategy at the end of this year. In time, all doing well for COP26, the major climate summit that's happening in Glasgow. Um, and that options consultation will be issued in uh, at the end of this month, quite soon indeed. And as Mike said, that's been that's been produced by true collaboration, not not just across the whole of government, because every department in in government here has got a stake in this. Whether they've got policy stakes or whether they tend to be the largest users of energy, they've all got a role to play. And then the challenge that. You know, I, I saw the report that the member mentions. I mean, the challenges, the challenges of vested interests are always there. I think it's how we deal with them. You know, I think it's important to understand not just what people say, but why they might be saying it, and that's something we take into consideration all the time. So I think I would like to give some comfort to members that we are engaging widely, and whilst it's people like the, the regulated industries, the network providers and the network operators are, of course, very important because they, they are operating billions of pounds worth of energy assets on behalf of consumers in this country. I think everybody has the right to play, and, and we've got a massive opportunity with decarbonization, decarbonizing energy here, and not just to get rid of the, the fossil fuel problem, but also to bring consumers to tackle the challenges of vulnerable consumers and to properly eradicate fuel poverty for the first time. Um, thank you. In relation to that, I think it's important to do that stakeholder engagement um, to ensure that that informs um, policy decision making. But one aspect of the narrow report was that in relation to the decision to increase the levels of support for small scale anaerobic digesters, uh, that decision was made uh, by the former department in 2011. And the, I was following a public call for evidence. Um, and you know, reported back that um, that there's a number of um, organisations and investors uh, provided evidence as part of that, and that there was no evidence of any due diligence being applied by the department to confirm the accuracy of that evidence. Um, serious concerns around that, and what measures are put in place to ensure that when you're doing that stakeholder engagement and you're looking for evidence, that there is that due diligence in place uh, to ensure that the evidence that you're you're being provided with is accurate. Mike, I'm happy to pick that up. Yeah, yeah sure. Okay. Yeah. 
No, uh, I mean, I, I suppose the comfort I would like to try and give is that I, I've been on both sides of the table. I mean, I was, I was, as I said, in the uh, senior management team in Phoenix, which was a greenfield private investment of of hundreds of millions of pounds in in an energy sector here in in, in Greater Belfast at the time. But I've also been on the other side of the table. I've worked for nine years as a non-exec in challenging what the private companies put forward in terms of the cost that they needed, because at the end of the day, consumers, we all pay for everything. Um, I suppose, you know, one thought springs to mind, you're, you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. And I think it's really important that we bring in the evidence. And then secondly, absolutely agree, it's really important that we actually do the due diligence. And I think returning to the, the particular point, which was the increase in levels of support back in 2011, I mean, the driving, the, dri the, the driving rationale behind that was the fact that over in GB, they were replacing for small scale generators the, the renewable obligation with the feed in tariff, the FIT. And that feed in tariff was going to increase the, um, the income for potential investors. And there was a real risk that Northern Ireland was going to be left behind. And we did the work. We looked at the we looked at the cost, and we and we and, and, and in our opinion, we challenged them. We challenged them very hard, and that was when the increase in the rock levels to four was put in, in order to bring Northern Ireland onto a level playing field. And, and surely, yes, we've been challenged often over RHI. Why we haven't the how we how, why we didn't challenge uh, on, on RHI the level playing field? We did that back in 2010 when we increased rocks to four to 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 bring our narrow in line with the feed-in tariff. So, I mean, there was a good rationale for that then. I would like to re-emphasize that, we, that we, we, we did do our due diligence. Okay, so you have been at odds with the audit office in relation to that comment around due diligence? Well, I mean, again, um, you know, it's, it's a question of, of uh, the work that's done to actually look at the, the detail that's brought forward. Mm -hmm. Uh, Richard, just to add to that point, I think you know at the time of the call for evidence and the consultation, there was a wide range of uh, of actual responses to come back. You know, and the you know the, the department looked at it in the round rather than taking a kind of of any of any one response. You know, as a result of that, then you know we actually built up seventeen different scenarios. Uh, you know, and done a done a cost uh, a cost benefit analysis uh, just to ensure that our uh, that our uh, we came to a, a surrounded, a surrounded view. Uh, I think the NIAO were uh, a bit concerned about AD in particular, in that you know most of the stations were coming in at 500 kilowatts, and in our scenarios we had we had actually put that in the in the higher bracket, in that the bracket was from 500 upwards rather than 500 downwards, which is where the actual uh, bond level actually actually fell. But what have we done? Uh, uh, as a result of the NIA report, we actually looked at the uh, at the model and the game, and actually put it in the situation that the NIAO had actually suggested. Uh, that actually came up that the the band and level would be uh, around about 3.9 uh, rather than 4.07. So it, it actually would have turned out that the rock banding would have been the same irrespective. Yeah, see, see in relation to. The, the rate of return. Um, obviously, uh, officials will be aware that there is a, now a debate and um, conscious of the correspondence we've received thus far in terms of the fact that the department's still considering the KPMG report um, on the renewables NI's submission in relation to the sort of overall rates of return. So I'm not really going to go into that because obviously you've, you're saying you're still considering that. But there's another role for the department to be able to independently analyse and report to us and to others what they feel is the rate of return because there's obviously what the audit office have reported and then what KPMG have reported. And, but there's, yeah, it seems to me, silence from the department in relation to what their feeling is in terms of what the rate of return is around uh, the, the issues that have had. Well, this, this obviously takes you to the heart um, of recommendation six, um, which as I said earlier, the department is content to accept in terms of um, looking at uh, rates of return. Um, as the audit office report was being constructed, obviously the department um, w wasn't content 
um, with the um, the twenty percent figure rate of return that was quoted um, in the paper, and that's why you'll see there's a number of caveats built into the report about you know where that figure is expressed as an opinion of the audit office, um, and that was before, you know, we had those concerns before. Um, we were aware of the KPMG work, and we will now obviously take that analysis forward. And um, the, the difficulty is that um, to get into the, the, the nuts and bolts of a rate of return, you have to then ask the operators to divulge commercially sensitive information from for the operation of each of their of their stations. And um, so that, that's that's a difficulty getting access to that information. But we'll we'll, we'll move that forward. Um, and as I say, you know, it's something we will seek to address when we construct a new uh, energy strategy and the renewables component of that. We would expect to see that commercially sensitive information made available to us. You know, but the, the bottom line, I suppose, is that the information that we have seen, you know, it, it, you know, it, it suggests that across those 134 stations um, analysed within the KPMG report, that the, the average rate of return across all those stations was somewhere in the order of 9.7%. Uh, the comfort we take from that is um, that's uh, well within the target range of 8 to 12% set back by the original data when um, the narrow was brought in. In terms of those commercial sensitivities and having access to that information, is it fair to say that that's one of the significant lessons learned around the narrow scheme in terms of being able to have access to that? So you have independent oversight on what the rate of return is. Yeah, so you know, it's one of the things that we will look to ensure is covered when we move forward in, in the successor schemes. Um, just, just one last question. Um, I'm conscious also members will have many other questions as well. Um, the the issues in terms of the relationship between the narrow scheme and planning and the requirement to have planning permission in order to be able to avail of the, the, the assistance, also in relation to environmental waste and also in relation to the rating system. Um, and obviously there's a, a potential loss associated with that in terms of non-domestic revenue from rates because of not being uh, notified and only can do a clawback for, for five years. Why was there not any attempts made? In reading the reports, there's a lot of legislative reasons given why the, this couldn't be the case, why they couldn't inform LPS in terms of rating and all the rest. But why there was there no attempts made to rectify that in terms of legislation? Because to me, we're seeing the outwork of this, the potential lost money to the public purse in terms of rates. We're seeing the impact upon the environment in terms of planning and environmental waste. And there should have been action taken to rectify the legislation in order to address these issues. Um, I suppose, well, my initial comment would be that it, it, it's really a reflection of the way in which legislation, um, primary legislation, it, is constructed and taken forward in Northern Ireland. It, it has in the past tended to be taken forward um, within departmental silos. And um, so, yes, you know, that, that is a weakness um, and the constraints that are embedded within that are, for example, you know, there are restrictions in terms of being able to share data across departments, which obviously played a part in terms of some of the information um, that wouldn't, wasn't uh, able to be provided to LPS or NIEA. Um, but, you know, for example, we were able to identify alternative sources of information. Um, so Ofgem, for example, we're able to point LPS in the direction of some published information that did allow them to recoup. Um, I think firstly all, I think of the, whatever it is, two million pounds notionally lost. I think that we're down to somewhere in the order of 100,000 or something like that, still outstanding. Um, obviously, these are one of the key issues, as I say, when we look, look to construct a new energy order. Um, this is one of the key aspects, just to be sure that it's part of the statutory consultation process. All departments are fully aware of the consequences in terms of the impact it may possibly have on their policy remits. Um, and thank you for that response. Um, if I'm going to be honest, I think a lot of the responses thus far are about what we're going to try to do in the future, mm -hmm. rather than trying to actually understand why was not action not taken to address this in the past. Because, and as I outlined at the beginning of my questions, there's been a whole issue here about capacity and capability. And I have no confidence that these issues are going to be fixed in the future in the context of what's happened in the past. 
and I need to understand why action wasn't taken to rectify these issues in the past when they were known that in terms of the planning system, in terms of uh, the rates, it was just accepted the legislation's there. We're not going to change the legislation and that we're going to have to live with it. Why was there not action taken to bring for legislative change? Um, well, I'll bring Trevor and Richard in in a second to give you the detail, but, but there's an issue here around timing as well. So um, you have to remember that it was in, as far back as 2011, at the UK level in 2012, in Northern Ireland, the ministers announced that the scheme was being closed. Um, so there were some difficulties. For example, one of the issues around was, you know, um, to do anything would have required primary legislation. For example, the introduction of a, of a fit scheme in Northern Ireland would have required uh, primary legislation and possibly would have reopened to the position with Brussels in relation to state aid approvals. But I'll, I'll bring Richard or, or Trevor in because to say, um, I, I'm not sure that your, your suggestion is that people were aware that there was um, an exposure to rates not being paid or environmental per, uh, permission not being granted was known from the very, very start. I think this was something that emerged later in, in the stage. Is that correct, Richard? Trevor? Yeah, just, just quickly for me, and I'll bring in Trevor. I mean, you know, first of all, the responsibility of, of, of uh, adhering to the law rests with each business individually, and that, that means each part of the law. Um, secondly, as Mike said, the, the, the narrow legislation mirrored the, or the renewable obligation legislation in GB, um, actually, one of the major criticisms in RHI was that we changed the legislation in Northern Ireland from 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 the, the GB legislation and went on a solo run, and that led to the significant flaw in the tariff. So, you know, I think we come at it from the angle that we mirrored the legislation um, in GB, and accepting your point that there should be better joining up. And Mike has said that's a commitment going forward. We cannot change the past. And it's important now that in this environment over the next 29 years, we need to get to a point of decarbonizing our energy mix that we get, that we learn from these issues of the past as we land our strategy this year, looking forward for the next 29 years. Trevor, anything else in addition to that? Yeah, just, just Richard, as you, uh, as you, you say, you know, the, the uh, Northern Ireland legislation uh, basically murdered, murdered the, the, the position uh, that was in the rest of the UK at, uh, uh, at that time. Uh, to actually move uh, dramatically from it uh, is rubbed with danger, as was actually shown uh, at the time of closure, 2006, when we tried to uh, uh, we tried to agree a different deal for Northern Ireland with regards to closure to small-scale wind uh, on the, uh, the uh, GB uh, uh, department deck at that time. Uh, put a uh, their legislation actually uh, had a uh, had an article that would actually have uh, ceased the trading of some Northern Ireland rocks uh, within the rest of the UK if we didn't do things the same way as them. So that would have been a difficulty. I suppose only our point is that the uh, the the NIO also recognised in the report you know the primary responsibility for the enforcement of planning and environment uh, legislation. Uh, rest with those bodies with the legislative uh, with the res legislative authority to do so, and that we actually don't have the expertise in that area. But just uh, important to note that uh, Ofgem, uh, in the role uh, as the uh, as the administrator of the scheme, if they're advised of issues uh, as a garden planning, for example, you know, whereas you know they haven't got the power to do anything directly themselves, they will pass that information to the relevant planning authority. Uh, for them to take whatever action they they feel is necessary, and I thank the officials for that response. The reason why I'm raising this is that we had a scheme which incentivised um, single small scale wind turbines, and we have high profile cases now where there's disputes in relation to the environmental impact in relation to that and planning, most particularly in relation to planning. And you know, it seems to me mad that you would actually grant fund or through the well through this scheme uh without actually having the necessary plan and uh, environmental licenses in place you know and i understand the points you're making in terms of everyone's got their legislative ability but when people look at this from the outside they find it difficult to 
to get their heads around the fact that you know rocks were being awarded, but yet the planning permissions weren't in place, uh, and there was nothing really done by the department to rectify that, other than sort of saying this as a lesson learned now from the scheme. So it's it's a, it's a real matter of concern, and then we have the the whole issue in relation to the uh, the the uh, financial transactions capital and the loan in relation to the uh, chicken waste. And, you know, I'm still not getting in on whether we need to consider this in private session, the assurance that all the necessary efforts were done to manage the risk associated with that loan. You know, there's an awful lot here screaming out to me to say that serious issues have happened in the past and real significant assurances need to be given that all was done to address those issues at the time. Well, yes, and if you look back, you know, obviously the schemes have been closed now four years. Um, but if you look back, um, you will appreciate all the difficulties there is in terms, particularly in a mandatory coalition, of getting legislative coherence and collaboration across departments. And as I say, um, you know, this department um, doesn't have policy responsibility and rates or doesn't have policy responsibility for environmental compliance. The key challenge now is to find ways in which we can deal with those issues, cross departmental issues as we move forward. And on the on, and on the, the, the Glenmore, the Donegal project, and as I say, uh, that is still progressing in terms of uh, uh, commercial negotiations. Um, there was um, an agreed way forward to meet an industry need. Um, loans were offered uh, and taken up. And as I say, the project hasn't collapsed, by what media speculation says. Um, there was a business case process, there was casework committee processes, all those things, the, no the normal approval processes were in place and are in place. Yeah. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, Thanks for both your evidence thus far. You both talked about how um, the intention uh, was to mirror the GB scheme, uh, both in legislation and approach. Um, but it is true that the Northern Ireland scheme was and remains more generous. Is that right? Um. I suppose it depends what your definition of more generous is, you know, because um, the schemes, on, particularly in relation to small-scale wind, started to change when the uh, when the GB started the introduction of the feed-in tariff to fit. So, you know, if you compare where uh, rocks were compared to Northern Ireland rocks, um, yes, you could say that Northern Ireland was pay, paying slight, paying more than GB, but you also then have to make sure that you factor in the additional support that went to renewable generation in GB, whether it was for fit or for contract for differences. So, um, I, I, I suppose my, my, my overview of it all would be that in the round, particularly from the period, say, 2010 through to about 2014, the incentives available in GB were more attractive than in, in Northern Ireland. And then in the two years from 2014 through the 2016 closure um, on the wind, Northern Ireland was probably marginally more attractive than in GB um, on wind. Is that probably a, a, a fair summary of, of, of the relative degrees of attractiveness, Richard, Trevor? Yeah, Trevor. I think just to add that, uh, Mike, you know, the first point it's important to, to note that you know with 80 85 percent of uh, uh of generation in northern ireland comes from large-scale wind uh and the uh the support for large-scale wind has been consistently the same across the uk uh throughout the, the, the life of, of all three uh, uh all three schemes you know so we're we're, we're we're talking about you know small small portions here of the uh, uh of the scheme I believe it's more your wind. Uh, first of all, you know the uh, the reason that we brought in a higher uh, rock banding level for small scale wind was in a uh, uh, direct response to the change in the uh, mechanism to support small scale small scale renewables in GB, and that they uh, they brought in the small scale fit from the first of April uh, two thousand and ten. Isn't it? There? Uh, 
with, with support that was much much higher uh, than was was under the ROs. So the the uh, the four rocks for small scale wind was brought in uh, to uh, to sort of replicate as far as possible the uh, the level of support that was available in GB to ensure that Northern Ireland developers uh, weren't going to be uh, disadvantaged. Uh, and so that's why the four rocks were brought in for, uh, for wind. The reason why we why we kept the four rocks in 2014 when we had a small scale small, small scale bond review was uh, based on based on the evidence to see. But it actually suggested that you know uh, the, the, the rock level could well have been lifted by half by half a rock to four and a half rocks. But the department decided to keep it at four rocks because the uh, level of uptake uh, was uh, was actually going well. Uh, okay, thank you. The, sorry, the uh, the AD is slightly slightly different in that uh, it, it came in it came in the first of April 2010, uh, and that came in the back of evidence uh, received from a call for evidence and from a consultation, and so again uh, that was based on on, on fact, okay. uh, based on evidence, and the, the same situation applied at, at the time of the 2014. Small scale bomb review when it was found that a low cost had actually reduced very slightly. Uh, they hadn't reduced uh, sufficiently to justify a change in the rock bonding rate. Okay, thank you. Uh, if I'm understanding you correctly, the upshot of that is that the reason small scale wind subsidy is significantly higher in Northern Ireland versus Britain is that the department has taken a view that it has encouraged uptake and therefore it should be continued. That roughly about right. No, no, that, that's not that's not a refer reflection. And as, as Trevor explained, there um, effectively the support was the same as the GB scheme until 2014. The the only change was the GB scheme for small scale wind became a became a feed in tariff. Yeah. Um, not an, not an RO, so it was equivalent rather than exactly the same. The period in time that the report refers to is 2014 to 2016 period. And it wasn't that we increased, our level of support was remained on same, remained the same. It was actually the GB support, the feed-in tariff was reduced. And it was reduced because of a factor called digression. It was reduced because of budgetary implications. And at that time, and Trevor will will will, will correct me, I think, or, or, or tell me the, tell you the detail. There was a UK Westminster Committee on the Environment that actually criticised the move by UK government to reduce the support um, because it was counter to the policy intent of the scheme. But it was all down to budget. Whereas, because we were still on the renewable obligation over here, we didn't have that issue, and therefore we kept our support in line with the costs. Indeed. Indeed, you know, the, the evidence base that was presented to us suggested that actually the cost base, as Trevor said, should have increased from four rocks to 4.5 rocks, but the department held it at four rocks for that two-year period. Okay. Just, to, just to add that, Mike, uh, May, the, the uh, actual deck review, uh, 2014 actually concluded that both CAPEX and OPEX had actually increased and that the, the actual fit tariff that actually existed uh, didn't overcompensate, and so as Richard really says, you know, the, the the reason that it was reduced was a was a policy decision by government to save costs, uh, uh, and was actually criticised. It was by the Westminster Environmental Audit Committee, uh, who uh, criticised it, uh, stating that it actually undermined undermined investor confidence, uh, and led to to an actual reduction in the number of projects being developed. You know, and also, sorry, just when I'm on that point, the that piece of work that was completed by DEC in 2014 included an actual review of the of the fit in the context of extending the fit to Northern Ireland, and this was the, this was actually rejected by DEC by DEC as it would as it would uh, increase costs to consumers in GB, but also increase costs to Northern Ireland consumers, and also they'd have to re-notify uh, for state aid clearance, and that would be problematic. Uh, simply because the the nature of the fit isn't uh, isn't competitive, and so uh, th that would have been a difficulty. Okay, um, uh, are you concerned, um, or were you concerned, 
that you're at the department's inability, and I don't say that in a pejorative way, correct me if, I'm, if that's the wrong word, but the department's inability to give a clear view of, its, uh, of the return on investment. You just mentioned the important of, importance of investor certainty. Surely inherent to that would be the department having a view on what they believe return on investment is for the average operator or investor in a small-scale wind um, facility. Sorry, Richard, I was just going to say um, the, the best the department can do is undertake analysis and research guided by experts on what a target rate of return would be um, to, grow, to grow the sector and say, you know, the initial target set was that 8 to 12 percent rate of return. Um, looking forward, um, as I say, we have to get now from 49 percent first to 70 and then to to, to 100. Um, so, so what we will do is we will look to see what degree of investment is needed in, in new and emerging technologies to grow the industry in Northern Ireland. And we will take expert advice on what an appropriate rate of return would be. The difficulty there is that um, companies will take their own investment decisions depending on things like their risk appetite and their awareness of technology and the skills that they can bring to the investment. And um, so, you know, we, we can't set a rate of return and ask industries to live through that. That's, you know, um, it, just, it just doesn't work like that in, 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 in the real world, the real commercial world. I, I appreciate that. You, did you not have in 2010 or indeed 2014 a worked example of how this might work for a typical investor and a typical, um, you know, for, you know, a typical small-scale farmer who's who's working with a, either an investor or a, a business. So there must have been a worked example somewhere where someone said, "This is how this might work and what the return on investment would be." Yes. So, um, sorry, Mike. No, I was just going to say, um, Trevor made reference to the, the many scenarios, the modelling work and the scenarios that were constructed back in in, in 2014, and the the. The consultant's advice that was put to us and um, suggested, for example, that costs have increased, so therefore rocks should increase um, from four to four point five percent, for example, in that specific case. Um, that obviously, you know, would, would have factored directly into the rates of return that those particular sectors would have derived. And um, so say um, there was lots of modeling work undertaken based on scenarios and rates of return would have varied across those scenarios. Okay, but uh, but, but no kind of necessarily um, biblical figure, as it were, in terms of what you, what the, what you think a typical um, return on investment would be. But I, I appreciate the point that you're saying that there might not be a typical return on investment, although um, others may disagree. I just want to ask specifically about, clearly this has met a policy intent in terms of moving Northern Ireland, uh, you know, increasing the volume of, our, of, of energy produced from renewable sources. But um, is there not a concern that or doesn't that argument sit uneasily with the high proportion of facilities we have which aren't actually connected to the grid? Therefore, we don't really have any way of knowing whether those facilities are actually contributing to the volume of renewable uh, energy either produced or used. In, well, we know it's being produced, but we don't know if it's going anywhere or anyone's actually using it when, when, they're not, when, when some of these aren't connected to the grid. about our ability to monitor between uh, connected and off-grid? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, Richard, do you want to come in here? You're on mute, Richard. Richard, I think you're muted. Oh, I'll send a message. <clears throat> Richard, are you... I think you're frozen, or are you, are you muted? Trevor, do you want to address this issue about the um, the off grid measuring off grid um, generation and, and the fact that it doesn't appear on the grid and yet is still remunerated? Yeah. Yeah. Well, well suppose, first of all, the 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 level of off grid is very small. There's 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 fifty one off grid stations out of almost twenty four thousand. So I think it's you know ninety eight point eight percent of uh, stations are actually uh, actually uh, 
attached to, attached to the grid. Uh, those those off grid are still uh, displacing fossil fuel uh, generation. Uh, obviously, they have to have a load on the on site, or else uh, they have to supply it by a private wire to uh, to third party. And so, because of that, uh, they're, they're, uh, the narrow is all about the generation of, uh, of renewable electricity. Uh, so they're doing that, and so they're entitled to rocks under the under the legislation. And that's the same uh, UK wide uh, across all the ROs, and, and also uh, as regards to the pit. But we would have a slightly higher. Am I right in saying we have a higher proportion of off-grid um, facilities than elsewhere? No, no, that's not, that's, oh, okay. that's, that's not the case. There's, there's uh, off-grid is, uh, is spread throughout, uh, throughout the UK. In fact, in, in terms of numbers, uh, Wales is, is the uh, Wales is, have, have less numbers than us. Uh, England and Scotland actually have more. Okay. Can I ask then, uh, if I may briefly, about the um, the uh, again the AD plant? Um, are there any other examples of investment agencies offering um, grant aid or a loan? Sorry, it was FTC rather than grant aid um, to build AD um, facilities on the basis of um, uh, conversations with. Um, a, a business sector, specifically in this case, obviously large poultry. But I think he has. I'm not aware of any, but um, we, we we can check and write right back to the committee on that. But I'm not aware. So, so it, uh, it, okay, um, and that that decision, that particular decision, it, it was based on um, the the judgment was that Northern Ireland had a large large and growing poultry sector which was producing huge amount of chicken litter and that has to be disposed of uh, and I'm just intrigued to know where did that conversation start did that did invest NI go to the department with a proposal or did the department I mean I know the invest NI reports to your department but I'm, I'm sort of intrigued as to where that particular conversation started or originated my understanding is that um Concerns started to deliver, develop in um, 2008, 2009, and really driven by uh, the Department of Agriculture at that time, which led to the creation of, as I referred to earlier, the Sustainable Utilisation of Poultry Litter Initiative. Um, so it was DERA, it was a range of key players, DERA, SIB, ourselves um, here in economy. Um, we're trying to find a solution to um, the the chicken litter problem. Mm. Um, so I, I don't, I don't, I'm not aware of whether Invest and I have given other loans. So, for example, um, I'll need to check whether the the plant that was talked about earlier in Balamina did receive um, loan facilities from Invest and I, but I, I'm not aware of it. But I will check and write back to the committee on that. Okay, and then my, my final question is about off gem. Have off gem at any time raised a concern about uh, what certainly appears to be a, uh, the, the, um, the fact that NI, that, that NI is, in a sense, creating a, a specific, not burden on bill payers in GB, but that we're, uh, as it were, punching above our weight in terms of um, uh, renewables obligation uh, and, and the impact on, on household bills. I, I, has that ever been raised by off and or would you expect it to be? No, certainly. Yeah, I, I'm going bring colleagues in in a second, but I'm not aware. I think you're, you're referring here to the fact that 80% um, of NIROX are exported into, in, into GB, um, but I'm certainly not aware of, uh, of any concerns where you know, uh, by off um, and, and Northern Ireland, we're, we're not unique in that, you know, so um, Scotland, Northern Ireland, I think, derives income to, you know, the, the audit office figures, £180 million pounds per year, or uh, the KPMG figures would suggest somewhere in the order of £240 million pounds per year um, coming into Northern Ireland. The Scottish figure is somewhere in the order of £700 million pounds a year in terms of income from exported rocks. Um, the, 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 net, the net result of that, okay, yes, income flows to here in Scotland, but it also is to the benefit of GB consumers because it means the prices are lower than they would otherwise have been if the Northern Ireland and Scottish rocks hadn't been put on the, the rocks market. 
Trevor or Richard, is anything further you want to add to that? Um, can I just come in there, if you don't mind? Um, Sorry, Trevor. <clears throat> that's okay. Can, can I just say to Richard Rogers, um, I'm being advised by those who know that perhaps if you um, drop out and come back in, then broadcasting will lag you back into the meeting. We've, we've, you've dropped out and we've lost you at the moment. So if Richard Rogers can hear us, so perhaps, or someone can pass that message on to him, uh, that would be helpful. Um, Mr. McBriar, do you want to come in in response to that question? Yeah, just, uh, yeah, I think it's important to emphasize just, you know, how, the, how the, the narrow actually operates and how it was actually intended to operate. And, and that is, you know, that the, the, the scheme, the Northern Ireland, the, the, the narrow works along with two other ROs, of course. And so it's a, it's a UK wide scheme that actually operates as one scheme and that uh, rocks are, are, are tradable on a UK wide basis and are equally acceptable everywhere. Uh, and it was designed, designed in the expectation that uh, that developers, you know, generators would, would obviously locate to the areas where there's the where there's the greatest uh, the greatest resource, but that the the cost, naturally enough, because it's based on the uh, electricity supplied, would fall in areas where there's the highest level of population. So uh, because of that, Northern Ireland has got a has got a tremendous uh, tremendous resource. Uh, we actually uh, uh, attract more rocks than we actually than we need to satisfy our obligation. So we're a net exporter. Scotland are also an ex uh, exporter, as Mike says, just to a greater degree, whereas England and Wales are net importers. And so they need to import uh, rocks to satisfy their obligation level. And so that's what happens. Uh, and that was exactly how the scheme was set up. So it's actually doing, it's doing exactly what it should do. It's a UK wide scheme. And so therefore, you know, rocks will, will be bought from the areas where they're uh, where they're in where they're in where they're in where they're, in, where they're, in, where they're plentiful. Uh, and so that, that's that's how it works. It's, it's, it's not you know, as, as some people have been saying the GB consumers are actually paying for the narrow. That that's not the way it is. Uh, thing is rocks are, are purchased from whatever whatever part whatever region to uh, satisfy the obligation level in, in, in other regions. So, my final uh, question, comment, it, it, uh, before I um, hand over to others, is really just um, there is this concern given that clearly this, um, lots of these projects have been funded or part funded by, for example, hedge funds in London who will have closely modelled numbers and return on investment in order to um, make multi-year and indeed multi-decade commitments. I'm still slightly struck as to why the department here responsible hasn't been able to um, have a clear picture of those numbers themselves, given that um, uh, inv investment managers in, uh, in, uh, in hedge funds will have done that. Um, notwithstanding, I accept they're clearly on the face that this has been a success in many ways. That absolutely was his last question. Do, do, do any of you want to come back on that um, before I bring in our next uh, member? Part of the reason why, um, well, two reasons uh, why uh, AD investment may have ramped up in Northern Ireland. Um, one was um, the returns achievable in, in, in the GB market deteriorated for the reasons Richard said out earlier. Um, in terms of digression, um, less attractive. Um, and the second reason is that um, the nature of AD um, means that Northern Ireland is a much more attractive place to set up in terms of um, the agricultural inputs that AD plants need are much more in abundance in Northern Ireland. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms Flynn. Um, thanks very much, Chair, and thank you to Mike and Richard and Trevor for your answers thus far. Um, Mike, you had mentioned in your introductory comments around um, that so hopefully you will have um, a clear picture on the rates of return soon. And I'm just wondering, as the department of yourself, are you just working towards a sort of date um, that you can expect to complete that process of work and to have that information um, at hand? And just also on, on that topic as well, I'm just wondering, um, I don't know if you have any more detail around that to provide the committee with 
today. Um, but if all that is a work in process, um, possibly you don't. Um, and I'm just wondering, have you been, um, are you having any issues or any problems with trying to access that the, that data and the, the calculations that you just need to get from the different bodies? Um, my understanding is that there's discussions ongoing with uh, KPMG and Renewables NI to get access to the information. I haven't been told that there's a problem, and the last I heard was the expectation was that the analysis we would like to have something by, I think, it was end of May was the date. And I, I think um, Tomas from the Audit Office, I think, has been involved in those negotiations as well. But my understanding was work would be done and we would have some outputs by the end of May. But um, say, uh, I'm not sure if Richard's back online, but um, to clarify or Trevor, but if not, we can con confirm it back to written writing and to you and the committee what the latest position is. Can, 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 can I just check whether I'm actually back online? You are, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was like yes, Harry well, Potter there. Richard. <laughs> um, Harry so, th thank you for thanks for that, Mike, and, and that would be useful. Um, you know, if there, there is any updates that sort of arise after today's session, if the committee, um, if we could get that in in writing, that would be really useful. And Mike, I know that you had also spoke about. So obviously, the positive is the fact that um, the scheme did exceed its target in the sense that it, it reached that that figure of 46% of electricity that is being generated via renewables. Um, you had also mentioned then the, the creation of jobs, the hundreds of jobs that it's created and the millions of pounds that has come into the economy as a result. And was there any sort of target set whenever you were designing the scheme um, for the amount of jobs and for the amount of money that would go back into the economy and have those targets, if that was the case, have they been met or exceeded as well? Um, so, my understanding is that when the scheme was set up initially, uh, the, the policy imperatives were, for example, to, to recognise, you know, um, fuel poverty in Northern Ireland, lower levels of income, um, and also when, when you, you talk about lower levels of income, there's significant divergence between urban and rural areas, okay? So, narrow, obviously, um, small-scale wind and AD, particularly benefits rural communities, so they were sort of policy, positive policy outcomes. In terms of a specific job creation target, which I'm not aware that there was one, but you know, we, we know, for example, um, the KPMG report suggests that in, for small-scale wind alone, somewhere in the order of 500 jobs have been created, and they largely are in, in, in rural areas. Um, and we also know that the Office of National Statistics in January 2020, I think it was, they published a report um, which suggested that the renewables industry in its widest sense it was at the large scale as well, large scale wind as well as solar and, and AD and everything, um, was uh, an estimated turnover somewhere in the order of about 1.1 billion. And from recollection, they said that that uh, also delivered somewhere in the order of 5,400 full time equivalent jobs in the local economy. So you can see it is actually a, a significant. Uh, employment generator, and they say there's lots more needs to be done in this space as we move forward from 49% uh, generation to get to 70 and then on to 100. Mm -hmm. That's great. Mike, if I, could, sorry, if, I, if I could just quickly add, if, if it's just a just a looking forward, uh, forecasts out of the UK are that there will be 710,000 long term jobs in the UK, and, and, and out of the Republic of Ireland, 38,000 jobs. Um, so we're like our our three percent share, if you like, would be twenty one thousand long term jobs as we get towards net zero, and we would expect because of what we've been talking about today that we've got a greater wind footprint, for example, that that twenty one thousand will be exceeded. So it, it is quite a material impact on our local economy. That's great, Richard. Thanks very much. And just two um, short questions, and final questions from myself. Um, maybe Trevor, this one um, would be directed towards. Um, yourself. I know when Andrew spoke earlier just around the issue of the um, so the, the small scale um, turbines and you know the fact that you know they weren't generating um, as much wind power in, in relation to how much um, financial support they were receiving. Um, and I know Andrew I think had asked yep he had asked around the reason um, for the higher level support for the wind turbines. And I think it was yourself, Trevor, maybe it was Richard, 
Um, but you have mentioned, so you have mentioned that obviously you went through a process of work and you were looking at all the different costs and that you wanted to bring the North onto a level playing field um, with Britain. Um, I think that was some of the rationale that was given around the the, um, the smaller turbines. Um, and then, because one of my questions was around, you know, I know Mike, you had said at the beginning that, you know, you're dealing with a lot of hindsight, you know, where we're at at the minute with looking at these issues. But one of my questions was, you know, would it have been more, um, a, a much better value for money if you had have reduced the support to the small turbines and focused on those larger wind farms, um, which are producing more renewable energy? Um, but Trevor, in, in your answer to Andrew at one stage, you had quoted some figures and I think basically was your answer that no, that it wouldn't have been the case, that it would have um, it would have been better value for money if you hadn't made that decision. I think, I think first of all, you know, the uh, we're talking about the uh, the objectives of the scheme. You know, one of the objectives of the scheme at the outset was to do with rural uh, rural diversification. You know, so the you know the decision was made, a policy decision to to uh, to support small scale, uh, any any of the bonding uh, uh, bonding levels uh, are are based on what the developer actually needs to to actually do so to actually develop. Uh, the thing is, uh, due to economies of scale and so forth, you know the larger scale guys don't need as much uh, don't need as much support simply because of the size and, uh, and so forth. The smaller guys do. Uh, and that's the, and so the uh, rock rate reflects that, and uh, was based on evidence that was uh, that was gathered uh, in that regard. Yep, no, that that's great, Trevor. Thanks very much, and I appreciate that um, that response. And then just finally, uh, maybe for your yourself, Mike or, or Richard. Um, so back to the issue of the um, the operating costs, and you know, I, th I think the committee obviously does understand that you know that this would have been difficult from the outset of the scheme because, you know, the fact that you used it naturally obtain those details around installation, and around the costs of um, operation. Um, so you know that they weren't required to be provided to yourselves, but. My question would be, so in the absence of that type of information, um, you know, how has the department assured itself or how does the department assure itself on an ongoing basis, in fact, that the rates of return at all levels are reasonable and, you know, that they're, they're not excessive? So if you don't hold that information, which I'm not saying it's the department's fault, but then how, how can you, you know, have that security and confidence that, um, that the, the, the rates aren't excessive? Um, I, I suppose the analysis of rates of return and requiring data to caveat rates of return um, would have to be looked at differently if, for example, this was grant support given directly to these people, okay? Um, but it's not. They're, 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 they're selling product in, in, into a UK-wide market, um, and the, that market is really determined and driven by Bayes. So there isn't... Uh, from a very narrow taxpayer perspective, there isn't a taxpayer exposure to this, okay, in terms of being worried about excessive rates of return. It's really around whether the rocks that are offered in that UK-wide market are sufficiently attractive to attract, attract commercial investment in providing wind turbines or whatever. And so if, if the, the, the rocks aren't high enough, people aren't going to build wind turbines, okay? It's just not going to happen. And if the, the, the rocks are excessive, being generous, then you will get inundated by people looking to build wooden turbines all over the place. The evidence suggests um, we have struck the right balance. And I think the KPMG material um, shows that. And as I said earlier, we'll get into the analysis in the April and May time. Hopefully, that, that figure will be confirmed. But one of the stats that gives some degree of comfort is that you know, if you if you look at the number of stations um, the accreditations that took place. So, for example, you know, the highest year it was 2008-2009, it was 161 uh, small-scale wind accreditations, okay? Um, but then when you look where you got to, then, it, you know, when four rocks were introduced, okay, in 2010, 
Um, you look at the figures after that in the years after 70, 30, 59, 95, and then obviously there's a jump up in, you know, at the end when they knew the scheme was closing. So what I take from that is going to Four Rocks in 2010, didn't send a signal out that there was excessive rates of return that could be earned and companies jumping into the market. That's not what the accreditation figure work shows. So I'm relatively comfortable that there wasn't excess profits to be earned because rocks were set too high. Fair enough. Mike, thanks very much. Thank you, Chair. Okay, okay thank you. Mr. McHugh. Uh, I've Chair. I've got uh, wait, this cost of finding the right. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you uh, for your statement today. Uh, those who are giving the evidence to the panel on that. Um, and there's no doubt about it, just the, the um, uh, success of uh, the programme in terms of energy produced to renewables and that. Uh, but sometimes I often feel maybe that in haste, you know, uh, that uh, rules tend to be uh, ignored. And I'm coming back to the anaerobic digesters in this one, uh, in a sense, just that well, we know a large number of uh, wind turbines and anaerobic digesters uh, uh, which didn't have planned permission, we're still able to join the scheme and continue claiming rocks. And since then, uh, many of them um, have been maybe in breach of uh, planning regulations as well. And, uh, and, I, and I don't think that it's um, sufficient or it's adequate to say, well, you know, really, even whenever it comes to the application of these rules, uh, we don't have the expertise uh, and it's sort of it's like passing the buck on to the council who come back out and effectively say the same thing. Uh, how do you feel about that? Um, well, I suppose my opening response would be that um, we had to make sure that we complied with, with the legislation that, it, that this department was subject to, which was the, 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 the energy order. Um, the issues around planning and environmental compliance, you know, when Ofgem are aware of the issues, they do notify, as Richard said earlier, for example, in the issue about planning non-compliance. When Ofgem are aware of issues, they do notify LPS, and that's been very, very successful in, in recouping outstanding uh, rates arrears. Um, so the policy responsibility resides, for example, on the environmental side, or in the rate side resides either with the Department for Infrastructure or with district councils. All, all Ofgem can do um, as the, the administrator of the scheme is when it is aware of issues, make the relevant authorities aware, um, and whether that means retrospective clawback or whatever, then to take action. But, you know, as I say, we have learned and we, we will endeavour in terms of moving forward with new renewable strategies to make sure that there's a better joined up approach across the NICS on doing this and working with local councils. I just maybe add that. It might just, you know, as regards to uh, planning approvals and, and waste management, you know, the, the department, you know, when we became aware uh, of, the, of the allegations about possible gaps and approvals, you know, we, we did set up a, a task and finish group uh, uh, along with uh, colleagues in the uh, NIEA and DFI uh, to uh, to identify if, if there were actually any gaps in any of those two areas. Uh, as a result of that work, which actually resulted in the NIEA, I think they actually went and visited it, it was 200 sites plus. Uh, there was actually 42 potential gaps, planning gaps, which were identified, some of which actually perhaps didn't need planning at all uh, uh, because they're so small. But nevertheless, they were uh, they were referred to DFI, and they were then taking it forward to see if any appropriate action was uh, needed to fill those gaps. Uh, well, just on that, in terms of we said the gaps and that and uh, the environmental impact, uh, do you feel that part of that uh, maybe in their haste to uh, encourage uh, uh, anaerobic digesters and other producers that? Uh, consideration or sufficient consideration was given to the sort of uh, environmental elements of it? Just, just on that, you know, I think it's important, you know, the, you know my 
is obviously our niche. NEIA, and I think uh, Richard sort of explained earlier that uh, whereas you know, of course, you know the the, the department interested in in uh, in AD plants, but it's the it's, it's the biogas that actually is uh, actually produced from AD. That's the relevant part to the uh, to the narrow. Uh, the, the narrow doesn't fund uh, any of the equipment or, or whatever to do with the actual AD plant. It's the it's the biogas only. The, the narrow is only concerned with the, uh, the generation of electricity. And so, you know, yeah, sometimes there may be a, a generation station actually attached to the AD, the, to the uh, AD plant, but that's not necessarily the case in, in every in every eventuality. And there's you know so. Biogas travels, uh, and uh, and so the the AD plant itself isn't isn't really within the remit of of DFE. Just just one other point, and then just for background information, is that there is, for example, a biogas generator in a in an industrial estate in Lisburn, and it actually processes around forty tons of food waste from supermarkets on an on a weekly basis. So. You know, you've got the rural aspect and you've also got the city aspect and, and in principle AD is a good thing, but it is, as the member says, it's how you implement it that is important. Well, as long as the uh, end doesn't justify the means uh, at the end of the day, uh, I think that in some cases uh, landowners uh, will seriously question how some of the venture capitalists uh, uh, have developed, we'll say, plants and that and how it impacts on the environment and on their land as well, and yet now they feel that there's very little opportunity uh, for redress and that uh, uh, councils, in particular in planning and so on, uh, tend to, as I say, offer up that type of excuse. We don't have the expertise to make judgments in this. So we can, yeah. I'm not sure there's yes. a question there. Yeah, um, yeah yes, that's what was there. Thank you. Is that you concluding your question, Mr. McHugh? Yes, I, don't, I, don't, I was making a statement, All right, okay. hoping that it might have uh, 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 encouraged a response, but there doesn't seem to be any. Right. Is your questioning concluded then? Yes. Okay, thank you, Mr. Beggs. I, again, thank you for your evidence so far. Um, one of the points that has been given to us today is that uh, the scheme mirrors the policy of the, the GB scheme. Uh, can I ask, do you, do you accept that once you deviate from the uh, financial rewards in terms of rocks, or for that matter, the fits that have been talked about, that the schemes deviate? Do you accept that? Um, so the, the biggest deviation came when, uh, as we discussed earlier, um, at GB level, uh, FIT was introduced. Why was it not introduced here alongside? Um, the, the two main reasons from recollection, and the guys could may be aware of others, one was it would have required primary legislation um, in Northern Ireland, and secondly, it would also meant that we would have had to reopen um, with the European Commission um, seeking state aid approval on a new scheme. But no doubt that happened in GB. Just to, sorry, just to, just to add that, Mike, uh, you know, we actually done a, a piece of work done in 2004 uh, to consider uh, what was the, uh, sorry, 2010, what was the, the, uh, the best mechanism to actually support small scale uh, generation in Northern Ireland. Uh, and the conclusion was. Right, and the, uh, the the conclusion was. Sorry, can you still hear me? Yeah? Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. The, the the conclusion was that the uh, that the narrow was the most cost-effective way to actually do so, uh, and that you know, uh, in the context of the uh, of the cost of consumer, and so there was there was there was no need, you know changing wouldn't wouldn't have been the right thing to do, and also as Mike says, you know, even if it, if it was a good idea, we didn't have the primary legislation. At that time, did it? So did you have any understanding why it changed in GB? If it's the best thing for the consumer, and you decided not to change here, why, why did they change it in GB? It's, 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 a, it's a different scheme than. Uh, I thought we uh, mirrored their scheme, but I thought we mirrored their scheme. Why did they change the scheme? 
Well, they 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 done their own assessment, and they they, they decided it was a, it was it was the best thing for them. It was a it was a it was a more controllable scheme than what the uh, what the ROs were. Okay, so you're saying our scheme was not controllable? No, what I'm saying is that the the uh, the work that we done uh, by experts uh, concluded that the, we should stick with the narrow, and so that's what we done. Right. Okay. Uh, earlier on. Um... Mike, Mike uh, Brennan indicated that the, 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 uh, there was no exposure to the taxpayer and that was one of the things that gives them a certain amount of, of confidence in, in the scheme. Uh, Mike, would you accept that there's exposure to electri electricity users? What I was saying was uh, when I said no exposure to taxpayer, it was in the context Sorry, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yep, yep. We, we, we can hear Sorry, you, but we not. don't seem to have a, any camera link with you, but we can hear you. Right, okay. No, I'm just I'm using someone else's computer here and it seems to be very intermittent. Um, oh, you're back. Right, okay. When, when I was um, talking earlier in the context of no exposure to the taxpayer, it was in relation to the question on um, taking a view in relation to rates return. Um, what I'm saying in answer to your question is, there is no cost to the taxpayer in terms of the exchequer it doesn't make a contribution to the payments for uh, to the generating stations. But yes, logically there is a cost to the uh, consumer. What I would also then say is when you think about that, you have to actually look at what the cost is and it's negligible. So as I said at the very, very start, um, the costs forecasts for Northern Ireland consumers um, could have been as high as I think it was somewhere around about 81, 82 pounds per annum. The actual cost for Northern Ireland electricity consumers is only £31 per annum. So the costs in Northern Ireland are considerably less than in GB. Um, and, uh, you know, so when you look at that metric, you have to say um, it has been a success from a Northern Ireland perspective. But yes, there's a cost to electricity consumers. And there will be, you know, as part of the decarbonisation agenda and the move to uh, more renewables, there will be costs that have to be incurred. You, well, the important thing to factor in here is that um, it's all part of reducing the reliance on fossil fuels and also um, important to bear in mind that wholesale electricity costs in Northern Ireland have been kept lower than they otherwise would have been as a consequence of, of, of narrow. Do you accept um, that this will have created great dissatisfaction from uh, GB consumers uh, in that we are giving away more rocks and they're paying more for rocks. Do you accept that there would be no, great no, dissatisfaction? No, 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 I don't accept. Sorry. No, no, it's far away, Mike. No, I was just going to say, no, I don't accept that. Um, and for the, the, the point that we made earlier about the reason why Northern Ireland and Scotland are able to export rocks is because they have a higher uh, ability to generate because wind is more prevalent. Okay. It's just like solar is more prevalent in the southeast of England. Okay. Um, so that's one of the reasons why Northern Ireland and Scotland have been able to generate rocks and export them. Um, but the, the other key issue here is that um, that has meant the cost to GB consumers because of the availability of Northern Ireland and Scottish rocks. It meant, means that the cost to GB consumers is less than it would have been. Sorry, Richard, I cut across you there. You know, uh, no, I was just to add to what you're saying there, Mike. Uh, you know, the, the, there are more rocks produced in England and Wales than there are in Scotland and Northern Ireland overall. What, what we're referring to is as a, as a proportion of our population. And that's because, as my, Mike My question said, is about the proportion of rocks per, per megawatt generated. Is that not the figure we all should be looking no, at? The, no, the, the, the proportion of rocks per megawatt generated was the same up until 2010 when the feed-in tariff was introduced and the GB scheme was, the, for small-scale renewables was moved from a, a renewable obligation to a feed-in tariff. And as Trevor mentioned earlier, um, this is the small scale end. The vast majority of generation under the uh, renewable generation is, is, large gener is large renewable, large generation, and it's, that's around 80%. So again, back to the point, Nor Northern Ireland consumers for the past 100 years have been paying for fossil fuel imports every single kilowatt hour of fuel that we have used for power, for heat and for transport has been imported, quite often to the benefit of developers off the east coast of Scotland in the North Sea, for example. This is the first time where we've been able to become a little bit more self-sufficient. 
50% of our electricity is generated locally. It means we don't have to import and pay offshore money for fossil fuels. And on top of that, what the support scheme actually gave us the ability to do was actually export effectively through the rocks uh, the value that is being created because we can produce electricity through the wind here. So that was the policy intention of the UK government when it introduced the obligation. And we've been part of delivering that. And that has been to the benefit of the economy locally here. Can, can I ask, I, can I, so I, sorry, I, go ahead. No, go, you go ahead. Go ahead, Mr. McPryor. Sorry, I was just uh, just going to add on. You know, as as the, the member said about you know uh, TV uh, uh, purchasing rocks in Northern Ireland. You know, the, I suppose the important thing to understand is that you know the, uh, England suppliers, English suppliers need rocks from Northern Ireland to enable them to to uh, meet their uh, the supplier obligation. Uh, you know, if, if there weren't purchasing rocks from Northern Ireland and from Scotland, a greater degree. Uh, they wouldn't be able to meet their obligation by uh, the presentation of rocks. So what they'd have to do then is uh, is to pay into the buyout fund, which in all probability would be a higher cost. And so therefore that would result in higher cost to consumers on the assumption that all costs of the ROs are passed on to consumers. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Brennan, I'd like to go back to uh, June 2015 when uh, there was a statement by the minister at that stage Jonathan Bell, and he said, I want to make it clear, however, that I do not intend to follow the Westminster government's policy to close the existing scheme Nairo, early. Can you tell me what was the thinking of the department at that time when the minister stated that? Um, to be honest, I'm not sure what the context is there, because the economy minister, the deputy minister, had announced in 2012 I think it was that the narrow would close in 2017. Um, so I'm not sure what that context is. We, unless uh, Trevor or Richard can elaborate, we'll have to look into that. But I'm, I'm not aware of what the context was for that statement. The, the context was the level of rocks had changed in GB, and the uh, UK government were wanting us to look at the attractiveness of issuing rocks locally. Yeah. So, so yeah. Trevor, you're, you're over the detail. You can talk about why this was driven by the bringing forward of the closure one year by the by the GB yeah. for the GB. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Mike, Mike was quite right. You know, the uh, the ADEC minister uh, did did announce closure in uh, 2011. And our minister had done the same in 2012, closure for 2017. But then, following uh, the Conservative Party's success at the election uh, 2015. Uh, their, one of their pledges was to uh, cut back on the support to uh, to renewables, and so what they done at that time was they uh, announced that they were going to close the arrows one year early to uh, onshore wind, uh, and so that's what the issue was, and I think that that's what the members, the issue the members trying trying to trying to get at. Uh, the, the the other aspect of. Um I understand the, the larger turbine scheme was fairly similar to GB, uh, but it's a smaller turbine scheme that, that, that was different. And uh, only 13% of the electricity is, is generated from 40, by providing 40% of the rocks. Do you think that's value for money? Uh, so, sorry, Chair, we can't, we can't hear the number. Okay. Only 13% of the energy generated from small-scale wind uh, is allocated 40% of the rocks. So what my question is, do you think is that value for money? I suppose it goes to your definition of what value for money is. And um, as I said, but I take the widest possible definition of value for money when it comes to narrow. And in that case, then I would factor in things like the amount of income that comes into Northern Ireland and the amount of jobs that are generated. So therefore, you would expect um, that the employment levels in a proportionate term would be higher for small scale and wind scale wind farms. And that's also why, for example, the rocks payments and therefore the, the income coming into Northern Ireland is higher than it would otherwise have been. Those are all issues and factors that we would need to feed into any determination and value for money. Okay. And, and did the department build into the scheme uh, any access to the amount of energy generated uh, uh, and, and the proportion of income from, from rocks and 
uh, energy generated, the, the, the difference between the two? Do, have you any sight of that? Do you know how, how dependent any particular scheme was on rocks compared to actual useful energy? I'm sorry, I'm struggling to understand the question. Yeah, I don't follow the question. I'm trying to understand uh, to what proportion were the rocks driving decisions rather than actual renewable energy being generated. How did the department know if they were getting the balance right? Um, I suppose, uh, if I understand you correctly, um, you're you're looking to see did we think we were over incentivizing or under incentivizing investment in the market, and if that is if that's the question, then um, as I said earlier, the key metrics you would look at are the extent to which, for example, on small scale wind turbines, the amount of accreditations um, was really flatlined um, through the period sort of you know from 2010 on, except for the last year or two when people were aware that the scheme was closing. Um, so there was no mad rush to invest in the industry because there was deemed to be the potential for excessive returns. Um, on the same side, the flip side of that is um, the rocks offered were obviously sufficiently attractive to encourage a degree of investment, which was why we moved from 3% of renewables in 2005 to 49% of renewables in December of this past. So I think a balance ha has been struck there. Looking at the environmental benefit of the scheme, um, do you accept that by allowing derating of turbines, we're not actually maximising the potential generating of renewable energy? I'm not, I'm not sure that I, would, that I would accept that. Um, do you not accept that if it wasn't derated, it would generate more renewable energy? Well, it's, it's, it's bound to be um, a, a further incentive, but I'm not, what I'm saying is I, I'm not sure the extent to which rates as a cost is a significant proportion of the operating cost of the wind turbine. I, I don't have enough detail on the, the, the commercial side of things to, to make, make a determination on that. Um, I mean, just, 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 just the one thing I would add to, add to that comment, if that's okay, um, is that Derating is a is is available across the UK. It's it's not something that we have here that is not available in GB. And the the impact of derating a turbine is that for any given site, there is an opportunity to produce more electricity up to the limit that's available under the support scheme, and that you know that is reasonable. So it's for for common that it'll produce a bit more electricity, but that is in line with the objectives and the intention of the of the of the scheme, the support scheme. And is it also fair, I think it's also fair to say, Richard, am I correct in saying that um, the excess element through derating has a significant offset in terms of a reduction in fossil fuel costs that would come onto the system? Indeed. I'll, I'll turn now to the... Just to, just to add that, to the, just to explain that you know, the, the, reason for, the reason for derating isn't, isn't just to, you know, to, uh, to, get, more, uh, get, to, to get more rocks. You know, on, on occasion, sometimes... Uh, uh, the uh, developers have to derate uh, to actually fit in with the, uh, the actual grid connection. And that, for example, if there's only uh, only availability of two, 225 kilowatts, for example, but they're, but they're unable to get their hands on that size of, of turbine, uh, to enable them to get on the scheme, one of the options is to buy a larger turbine and to derate it down to 225. Would you accept that derating changes the generation envelope and allows more energy to be generated there without reducing the rock subsidy? In fact, it increases the amount of rocks that you'll ultimately be able to get to that site. Yes, but it, but it, but it also increases the amount of electricity being generated at that site without the need to to, you know, to, to actually have other sites. You know what I mean? Certainly, you know the, the whole idea of the of the narrow was to generate as much renewable. Okay. Um, just follow up the comment there about the just, objectives. Just saying, uh, sorry, could you could you just repeat your answer there, Mr. McBride? You dropped out. Oh, sorry. Could you so just... I was, sorry, can you hear now? Yes. I was just saying, sorry, the member was saying uh, uh, about derailed turbines. I was just uh, saying, you know, that, yes, the, the, the whole rationale for the, for the narrow 
is to, to generate as much renewable electricity as possible. So you know the so really you know the the uh, the more the more efficient a uh, station is uh, is probably a good thing rather than a bad one. Well, in, terms of, in terms of generating renewable energy, that's the, the policy you've said. It. Uh, I'll turn to the off grids. Others have mentioned uh, them, whether it was some 54 uh, off grid um, in receipt of rocks. Um, now, the, the, the information we have been given is that there's no evidence to demonstrate that any of these stations can be shown to be using electricity generated in a deliberately wasteful manner. Now, that's very, very careful language. If, if you heat it, uh, and then the machinery uh, shared uh, with electric heaters, would you be entitled to use the scheme, even though that was never a requirement of that facility in the past? I mean, with the problem with RHI of heating empty sheds, and it was deemed to be appropriate if there was a tractor sitting in it. So I'm asking, under the narrow, narrow scheme, can the scheme receive rocks for heating a, a machinery shed. If, if I if I could if I could pick that up, Mike, if that's okay. Um, there's no there's no developer, there's no business, there's no farmer who by choice would be off grid. And the clamour throughout the lifetime of the scheme was we want a grid connection. And grid connections you know were, are coming on all the time because the electricity that they produce Clearly, they can produce more electricity because the difference between electricity on a boiler that you mentioned is that the electricity has to have a demand on the end of it. So you put a you put a bar heater. You might get a one kilowatt, three kilowatt, ten kilowatt heater. It's not going to move the dial. They want to be on the system, and they want to. So when they when they can't be on the system, and, and the other the other context aspect of this is that there are only fifty four off grid stations out of 23,600 accredited stations on the scheme. So we're not talking about a big risk here, but we're talking about a risk that has been managed by the department with the utility regulator in a way that ensures that we minimize the risk of what, what the member describes that is a risk that producing electricity that is not useful. But to go back to my original point, every participant would want to have their generator connected to the grid because in that way they can actually use the turbine more than they can when they're off the grid and and that's the evidence that we've seen as we've run the scheme over the past 15 years. Do you accept that going forward and, and we're here to try and learn lessons for future schemes that it will be essential that uh, there's clear planning permission given for, uh, for future uh, generation capacity uh, so that it would not be breaching planning regulations. We've had instances of that. That there would be a requirement for waste licensing, because again, we've had issues with generation qualifying for rocks when there's been no waste licensing. Uh, and indeed, transparency, so that information can be shared with all departments without any restrictions on data protection, so that uh, local rates could be raised uh, and, and uh, appropriately. So do you, do you appreciate there needs to be a greater level of transparency and sharing of information for the public good, not just for the benefit uh, of uh, a small number of individuals who, in my experience, have been larger farmers and hedge funds? Yeah, but I've already signalled that that's the ideal that we're working towards and as part of the new energy strategy, there are cross-departmental working groups and what we will seek to do is have as much transparency as possible as to how we're constructing the new schemes that will be operationalised in the future for renewables so that, for example, colleagues in the Department for Infrastructure or DERA or LPS will know exactly what our intent is and they will have had a chance to shape the new scheme. Okay. And just one additional point, just one additional point I'd make is that um, whenever any business is going to invest in, in new capital opportunities, it will tend not to do that from its own resources, but it'll go and seek the investment from first off to the local bank. And so there's a significant proportion of the participants in the in the narrow will have got their uh, their investment capital from local banks, from banks 
wherever, as well as from investment houses and, and the, uh, as the member said, potentially uh, venture venture capital hedge funds. Um, so, I mean, that's just the nature of business and how we do it in the capital economy. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Harvey. Thank you very much, Chair. <clears throat> thank you, gentlemen. I believe the small um, wind sector brings in £45 million a year and sustains some 500 direct or indirect jobs. Um, I was just wondering, what's the average cost of one of these turbines to a Northern Ireland customer over a period of time? Now, you did mention there £35, but that's for like the, the complete number, which is, is it either 700 or 1,200 turbines we have in total? There's numbers being sort of jiggled around here today. I'm just wondering how many turbines actually are we talking about? Yes, the, the figure I quoted was the total cost of narrow to uh, local electricity consumers was 30, 31 pound. 31. Um, 31, yeah. And I think in total there's, I think it's 1,209. Um, small scale wind turbines, that's those below 250 uh, kilowatts. Um, I, I think I, I have seen figures for the, the costs, but I'll, I'll traverse them on in detail. But I, I think somewhere in the order of um, one pence per kilowatt hour or one pence per year or something, Trevor, um, maybe you can have more insight on what the small scale wind costs are to the consumer. If not, we can we can write write back to it. I'm not sure, Mike. I know those uh, those figures. I think you're you're quoting that were included in the KPMG report. Yeah, we we'll, we can double check uh, and and come back. But as I say, that's the figure I, I recollect seeing somewhere. So Trevor says it was in the KPMG report. And um, obviously we haven't validated it, but we will, we will see if we can get to that wind small wind uh, cost component um, for a Northern Ireland electricity consumer. And I think the important, I think the important figure, sorry, just to just to finish on that is that on average it's thirty one pounds, thirty two pounds, including network costs per annum. So that's around in about sixty pence a week to the local electricity consumer. That's that's the cost of the narrow, on average. To, to be able to produce fifty percent electricity, and that's very good. Um, also, there's other figures. Um, being moved around here on the return on investment um, with 20 plus and then with maybe 10 or less and also based on sometimes based on one turbine and then maybe 10 and then it's up to 134 the bottom line really is an obligation to be accurate here I mean we know that recent media attention generated because of the excess of 20% return, which now may seem to not be accurate, and this put unnecessary attention on departments and ministers, which in itself is unfair. So I think we really, our obligation is to be accurate here. Would you agree with me? Uh, agree wholeheartedly with you. Um, I have to say, you know, the 20% the figure did generate a lot of uh, media interest. Um, and as I say, it was based on just one uh, station that was off grid. Um, the KPMG report does take us further, and it refers to 134 stations. Yeah. Okay, um, and you, you, the calculation of rate of return there was 9.7 percent. So I, 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 you know, I, I can see your frustration because on the one hand, someone said 20 percent, and the other hand, it's 9.7 percent. And you know. Going back to other members' questions, we will endeavour to work with KPMG in the coming weeks uh, um, to firm up on what we think is happening here. And that does tie directly into recommendation number six in the report. But as I say, you know, the larger the sample size, and going from one to 134, I would like to think then you're getting closer to the total population estimate. And um, so, therefore, uh, you know, I, I, I would be more comfortable that the the, t the initial targets set by the department of eight to 12 percent has been adhered to. Exactly. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Boylan. Thanks, Chair, and thank you very much for the presentations. Uh, Mike, I appreciate the in relation to moving away from fossil fuel use and trying to reduce your carbon footprint. But we want to take back to the um, whoever wants to answer the question. You replicated the scheme from England, but I mean clearly 
what we've learned now and the things we've done in terms of planning and environmental impact, we we hadn't we haven't got it right, and the report indicates that. Um, just want to pick up on a few points in particular in relation to honourable honourable digester. Um, now I know in my own area when the uh, the plan of mission gives the one the South Side Armagh City, and we place called Milford. As part of the business plan, um, or as part of the application process, there was a business plan put in place. And basically, what it was about was it was about the, the feed in terms of the silage, the slurry, the capacity was needed to run the plant. Now, there was serious questions about that at the time. So, as put in, in the report here, it indicates. It takes a large amount of slurry and silage and all the waste materials to run these plants, the num given the number we have. Um, in terms of your consideration, did, was any consideration given to increase in the price of silage or slurry or transportation costs or in general land valuation in relation to um, once you want to introduce this new technology, was any consideration given to those in it, unintended consequences of what might arise from that there? Or was it clearly the big demand to feed all these all these um, anaerobic, anaerobic digestive? There was talk about going over to Scotland and bringing feed over. So was any consideration given that? Uh, I'm not aware of that dimension at all or what assumptions are made in relation to the AD inputs. Um, as I say, um, the question was, was would four rocks um, uh, be, be sufficient? Um, uh, all I can say is that you, you, know, you, you talk about you know, planning for AD and you know, there are issues that we've talked at for length now this afternoon about you know, how do we rectify that going forward and, and rest assured we will look at those issues. Um, I'm not sure, Richard or, or Trevor, if you got any greater insight into the extent to which the input costs to AD um, have altered the, uh, shall we say, the growth in the ADs in Northern Ireland. All I would say, my take on it would be that ADs would probably have to have a growing future in, in Northern Ireland going forward. Given the growing constraints on and need to, for example, environmental compliance and standards and directives on nitrates and ammonia and stuff like that, so I think that they will have a growing role to play going forward. But I'm not sure the extent to which, um, in the past, distortions on prices or silage or whatever have influenced the investment behaviour of ADs. If I just add a bit to it before maybe Trevor might provide a bit of detail, but. Um, the scheme accredits biogas generators, and um, as you say, to produce that biogas, uh, it's a biogas from anaerobic digestion. In in principle, anaerobic digestion, and I'm not a farming expert, so forgive me, but it, but in principle, anaerobic digestion is a good thing. It's a good thing because it just prevents the slurry from spread on the land and adding to our nitrates problem. And one of the things that we're starting to see, for example, through the the Tully Quarry investment in, in Balamina with Stream Energy is, and, and other investments like it is, what do we do with the digestate that's left behind whenever we take the biogas off? And that's the, the final piece of the jigsaw in solving, if you like, the nitrates problem, the potential of combining it with carbon dioxide for drop-in fuels and the like. So it, it's an exciting space, but as you say, it's really important to understand, are we getting unintended consequences? And I think um, the challenge in any business investment is, if a business makes a commitment to provide a certain amount of biogas to a generator who wants his or her return on investment on the generating set, then uh, it might then become difficult to actually produce the amount of gas. And that's where we've seen some of the tensions clearly arising. Um, and and that, that's, that's a risk in any, you know, that's the uncertainty in any business investment. I mean, returns aren't guaranteed in the same way. Some, some wind sites are windier than others, and sometimes the wind doesn't blow. In terms of AD, it has its risks as well. Is there anything else, Trevor, we, we should mention on this to the question? Uh, I don't think so, Richard. Okay, sorry. That... Well, well, Richard, I'll, I'll put it a different way to you because all these plants need, let, let's put it in simple terms, it's a fuel, right? The slurry and the silage is a fuel. 
So my question is, you, what you're saying to me, you haven't seen an increase in prices on that side of things, because surely do we, do we have to get out of the country to get this fuel, be it silage, slurry or waste components, whatever it is, to fuel these? Obviously, there was no consideration given at the time in relation to that. You, you, had, you wouldn't have had enough detail. That's my, that's my main yes. point. Yeah, and and that and that's a fair that's a fair point because what we've we've been saying, if you like, throughout this afternoon is that we haven't in the regulations got a requirement for the generators to actually provide the commercially sensitive information on their costs and indeed their incomes that they generate through the, the market mechanism. Uh, ironically, that's different from the RHI scheme where we have the we were able to get a hold of all that information on a confidential basis, and that's one of the things we have to improve going forward and it's one of the challenges in actually delivering on recommendation six is getting access to the commercially sensitive information. No, and I appreciate that and, and anybody who's been a counsellor or a rep, we all understand those arguments when, when these applications are put in and clearly we um, appreciate Mike said earlier on, there definitely needs some more cross departmental working in these here because I mean, that the has caused a lot of issues for be it at local level or, or you know, reasonable level given given plan permission. The, the other point and you've touched a wee bit on it, I know I just want to know about the but this the issue of the emissions because I mean clearly the, the departments uh, has some concerns about the, the digest it and the emissions arising from it. Can you comment any more in relation to how you're engaging with the say NAEA or, or the, the department in the other department in relation to those issues or what you've learned from uh, I'll, I'll bring Richard in a second. What does it say? We have, as part of our future forward look in terms of the strategy, um, a number of cross departmental working groups. So, DERA, NIEA, they are all represented on your working groups, Richard, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. And, and just to add to that, I mean, it, clearly, DERA take the lead for us here locally on climate change. And as part of that, um, we have the chief executive of the of the you know, the environment agency in the heart of this. So we have her and her officials working with us on the development of the new policy, and and they will have been part of the the process in establishing the detail in the options consultation. And the member raises a really important point. You know, it's not just about the energy aspect of this, but it's also about the feedstock, and that, that's something that we're considering as part of the of the development of the new energy strategy. No, I appreciate it. Chair, that's it. I think most of the questions were asked before I get in, but that, that's, that's me. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I have no other member who's indicated they want to uh, ask questions, so everyone's had their opportunity to have their spoke. Uh, Mr. Brennan, in relation to the um, formulating primary legislation, which um, Mr. Boyle has just made reference to, which you said earlier in the meeting, I think that's crucial if lessons are to be learned in, in relation to this not just around this issue, but so much in terms of uh, government in Northern Ireland. Um, are you confident that that's going to happen? Uh, I'm very hopeful that things will get better, Chair, is probably the best I could say. Um, all we can do as officials is make sure that there's better cooperation and collaboration between officials and all other departments, and that we're as, as fully informed and cited on each other's plans in terms of progressing relative pieces of legislation. Um, so uh, I, I do take heart that, you know, if you look at the PFG and the commitments, for example, in New Decade and your approach, you know, the, the area, the non politicals, the non-contentious areas tend to be in this space around energy and environment and climate change. So I, I'm pretty confident that moving forward with primary legislation um, it, it'll, it, it should be easy to get not just official buy-in and collaboration, but political buy-in and collaboration. This is now our sixth, right. sixth uh, report, report, and uh, I have to say this is, it seems to be a recurring theme, and it is something which we need to address. Uh, and I know, obviously, this is something we've put uh, to other permanent secretaries and other departments uh, that have been in front of this committee, so you're not being singled out around that issue. We have made that point to the former head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service, and we'll make that point to the new head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service when they're appointed. That collective responsibility is absolutely crucial. This is far too small a place for that sort of joined-up governance not to happen. 
Uh, did someone else want to come in there? Yeah, I, I was just going, going to add, Sheriff, if that's possible, that, again, in, in positive vein, uh, DERA, who are leading on the climate change bill, uh, in which energy produces 60% of the emissions, the, the DERA minister has established an interministerial group, and on that interministerial group is DFC, DFI, ourselves, and the Department of Finance, as well as the TEO. So you've got a clear signal of intention there that this is not DERA's climate change, it's not DFE's energy strategy, it's actually a collective responsibility and the, 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 the issue now is seeing that through as we get into the new world of, of, of property, as Mike said, joining up, um, how we deliver uh, these services locally. You know, Chair, going, sorry, Chair, I just was say going back to your more broader strategic comment, uh, just in summary, I couldn't agree with you more, but you need to move in that direction. Yeah, I do welcome as well that the, the acceptance by the Department of Recommendation 6. Uh, I think that's something which uh, we as a committee uh, would very much see as a positive and, 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 and I welcome that. Mr Rogers, you said that uh, in terms of the, the figure moving from 49% to 70% and um, 21,000 jobs being uh, created in the Northern Ireland economy, have we a time scale for that? Well, th th this is what's going to come out of the energy strategy and, and later this month, as I said, by the end of this month, we'll have the options consultation and the intention is to land the energy strategy by the end of this year. Um, it, it, was a, it was a proportionate number derived from yeah. research that's been done by both the UK and ROI governments. So um, the important thing is that we're on with it now. Uh, our minister has signalled already intention and that is that this minimum of 70% target for renewable electricity by 2030 and also that we are we are actually producing the first green hydrogen through electrolysis, and that hydrogen is to be utilised in in the hydrogen fuel cell buses that are built in in Wright bus. So we've already we're already leading, um, we're already leading on renewable electricity production, and we're already leading on the development of the hydrogen economy. And in that are the jobs of the future, and we're linked up with the with the colleges of further education and higher education in terms of the skills that are needed. So for the first time, as you as the committee will have noticed. Um, in the economic recovery plan, clean energy is an important sector and it's highlighted in there and that would not have been the case in the past. Well, those are certainly encouraging signs and obviously Wright Bus is a world class product that is exported worldwide. There are other buses you can buy as well but we would recommend you buy Wright Bus I suppose is the line. Um, in terms of, in terms of the, the, um, the the fifty percent of electricity now generated locally, that's that's a tremendous figure from, from a starting point of very little or nil. Over what period? 3% Chair in 2005, I think that's the correct figure. Yeah, yeah. yeah 2005. So we've, we've increased from 2005 from 3% yeah. to 50% uh, current day. That's tremendous. Other members have mentioned this, and I, I would like to return to it as well. In relation to the, the plant in the Irish Republic, um, I, I suspect and I respect uh, the, the confidentiality around that, um, Mr Brennan, uh, but I, I know that hopefully you and colleagues will come back again to the committee for an additional evidence session when you've concluded your verification around these issues. Um, I think part of that uh, particular session being in private around that issue might be useful because I have questions. But I'm conscious of the fact that, I, and I, I read the message, that there, there are sensitivities around those things and perhaps negotiations going on. But I do think that's something which the committee would want to pursue uh, in private, if um, you're comfortable with that. Certainly, Chair. And if, if it helps, there's, uh, I think, two or three points where we've promised to write back to your committee as a consequence of this session today. Um, if, if, if it would help, we could maybe set out in more detail in that response where the Donegal plant is um, and then treat that submission as commercial and sensitive. Um, and as I say, you know, I would expect the updates on this progress to come to both the Invest and I Audit Committee and then through to the Department. So I'm more than content to come back and, and provide a confidential briefing to, to your committee. But again, if these are questions you can't answer, but I, I presume the siting of the plant in Donegal was a, was a planning issue, that there couldn't be a site found in, in, in the Northern Ireland jurisdiction. Is that right? 
Um, my, my understanding, Chair, is that there were proposals. I think one, for example, was R Rose Energy, from recollection, to take forward developments in Northern Ireland, but they, they, they failed, I think, for a number of reasons in planning was, was, was the, the number one. I think it was more of an incinerator, Richard, is that right? Uh, it was an incinerator, and um, I think it was, you know, there was issues around emissions and environmental health concerns. So um, the difficulty was um, no one really wants one of these plants close to the back door. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, can I take this opportunity to um, thank Mr. Brennan, Mr. Rogers, and Ms. McBriar for joining the meeting this afternoon. Um, as I've said, we will perhaps have a second session. Uh, uh, early in the summer, uh, if that's okay, uh, and um, thank you very much indeed uh, for your your um, answering of questions and candour this afternoon. It is much appreciated. And um, uh, can I ask broadcasting to um, allow Mr. Brennan, Mr. Rogers, Mr. McBride to leave the meeting? Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you, Chair. And sorry for the IT glitches earlier on. Thank you. Okay, members, um, we will now go into closed session. Do you want to ask Jared, Stephen, anything? This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.